A series called Grow. We've been talking about um, what are the four essential things that we wish, or to, uh, you know, we wish, we, we pray for to see happening in our church and specifically in your life. Um, we designed a series called Growth Track, which uh, basically is a four-week class that we wanted to do with you, uh, in which you get to understand, you get to see what is the heart of Capstone for you. What do we want to see people? happening in your life when you come to this church? And how do we want to see you um, making a difference in this world? Um, so we, as we sat down to, to start putting together this material, which, um, which would ultimately become what we call now Growth Track, uh, which is happening from this afternoon. In fact, um, those who joined us already um, are, going to, are, are going to start the Growth Track this week. Um, you know, as we put together this, this material, we realized this is something that we can teach even in the church to you um, because we, we felt this is something everybody in the church who attends the church should know. What is the heart uh, that we have uh, for you? So as, as we began to write down uh, four things that we felt are essential for us to, um, for us to grow for, you know, as, as a person that God desires us to be. Four things that we want to see um, in your life. Number one, the first one was our prayer being fulfilled in your life. We call it our dream. Last week we talked about it. Our dream for you is essentially what Paul was uh, talking to Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1. He prays a prayer um, for, for the church in Ephesians and saying that God, God, every time I think of you, I thank God for you and this is my prayer for you. And he's got this, um, this, got this, this wonderful prayer that, um, that that I explained to you last week, uh, basically, this is our prayer for you, that you may know God. That when you come to this church, you don't need to know my name. By the way, for those of you who joined us for the first time, my name is Chaitanya. Just in case you know, you're curious about my name. Thank you for joining us today. You know, we are supposed to invite you. Uh, uh, it's never too, never too late. It is, thank you for joining us today uh, and worshiping along with us. So we, we, our goal is that you may know God. That's number one. Um, whatever we do in the church, from the beginning to the end, that at some point you get some, some knowledge, personal knowledge of who God is. That you have a revelation from God about himself so that your life can be changed. At the end of the day, more than uh, you agreeing with our doctrine, more than, uh, by the way, we are Pentecostal. I mean, I assume you have got minister, ordained minister. But that doesn't mean that you should stop coming to our church. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with me when it comes to speaking in tongues. What really matters is that you know God. That's our goal. Our goal is that people may know God. That's our prayer. That's our dream. Number two, that, that you may find freedom. That it is in this place that you find friends beginning to develop relationships who, who become your strength in your weakness and you become their strength in their weakness. Is the true freedom is found in the church, found among people who are like you, imperfect people uh, who are journeying together towards what we call the perfection Christ. That's our goal, that you find freedom uh, um, uh, um, in your life. Number three, uh, that you may discover your purpose. We're going to talk more on that today that you may discover for the purpose which God created you. And number four, that once you discover your purpose, you begin to make a difference through your life. 
that wherever God placed you, whatever job God placed you in, uh, whatever neighborhood God placed you in, that you begin to make a difference through your life. We're going to talk about how do you do that over the next two weeks too. But today we're going to talk about your design. The second aspect, second dimension, second ingredient in, in our growth process is what I want to call, what we want to call your design. Because not only our prayer is important, but your design, the way you designed is also important in, the, you know, in, in growing and becoming more like Christ. And that's, uh, that's explained brilliantly uh, in Paul's words, and that's why we are here at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read one verse, and in fact, I'm going to flesh out that one single verse today, uh, because just that one single statement has so much um, hidden inside that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10. If you have your Bibles, by the way, if you're writing your notes, we have the notes printed out already for you, so you can start taking down the notes, or we have it on U version. If you're a digital person, just take out your phone. You're allowed to use phone in the church, not for Facebooking, but to read your Bible. Uh, so you can, you can go to U version and just follow the steps. Go to more, click on, click on more, and you'll click on events. And once you click on events, you can find Capstone. And you'll have two options, Capstone Hydex City and Capstone Art Singhi. Just click on Capstone Hydex City right now, and you'll have your notes there. You can start typing your notes there. All right? Uh, so we're going to talk about your design today. Um, Paul, in one word, explains the whole idea behind it, uh, uh, you know, this idea of your design. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me explain this concept of your design in four statements. You may already know some of it, but it's good to be reminded of this. Number one, so that you get a clarity on this concept of your design. Number one, God created you with a specific purpose. God created you with a specific purpose. This is what Paul is saying. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. The word created brings to our attention the kind of value that God placed upon our lives. That while everything else, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, and you begin to read the account of creation, you would see this, that for everything else in this creation, God used his word, except for man, that God used his hands. Just the fact that God decided to get involved directly, personally, to create you and me, exhibits the kind of value you have in the sight of God. And if God placed so much value on you, then you must be somebody with a purpose. I don't know how you walked into the church this afternoon. Maybe you're wondering, uh, does, does your life even worth living? Maybe you're wondering, what am I doing? Why am I living? What am I doing, the, the thing that I'm doing? I, uh, I don't know how you walked into this place. Maybe a question, a confusion about your life. I want to tell you this, that you are valuable, that you have a very specific purpose with which you have been created by God. Nobody else, by God. That in all creation, that God decides that uh, you and me are not going to be fluke. You and me are not going to be some freak accident. That you and me are going to be created with a value carefully crafted by a caring God. God has a purpose in creating you. I want you to, you know, these words drill into your head and sink into your heart and go to your guts till you understand this idea that God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for creating you. You, 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 you the, the, the fact that, that, you know, this is the fact that nobody who is here, sitting here, standing behind us, standing here, uh, or, or in this place, um, is breathing. Nobody who is breathing is without a purpose. Everybody is with a purpose. That your very existence 
was planned by God. God knows where you need to be born. God knows to whom you need to be born. God knows where you need to study, in which color you need to be born. God knows whom you'll get married to. God knows who you need to, whom you will give birth. He planned it. He laid out every single thing. Because he has a purpose. Yesterday, we had an op uh, we, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, celebrate along with a couple from our church, uh, their first child, their, their, uh, their second child's first birthday. Uh, when we went there for the birthday party, um, uh, um, you know, God reminded me, Holy Spirit reminded me to read a scripture um, from, from the from book, of, book of Psalms, Psalm 139. Uh, psalm 139 is a psalm, um, what, what we call the reflective psalm. You know, it's a psalm where this guy, the poet, is actually sitting back and looking at his life, looking at all the, 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 the life as such, and, and, and um, uh, wondering that how God is actually functioning behind it. Um, he, he talks, he, he's, 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 he's in this um, mode of, 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 um, uh, of worship, adoration of who his God is and how beautifully uh, God runs this whole world. And in the middle of all that, he begins to look at his own life, look at himself and, 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 and begins to thank God for who he is. Two verses in Psalm 139. I just want to read them for you. 13 and 14. Um, you made all the delicate and inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I mean, what a way to explain that. Your creation, the way you were born. You, I like it. He, you made all delicate and inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Did you see the words that he's using? Hey, I'm he's saying I'm complex. Ask any doctor if, if, the, if there is a doctor in the house. Every single day, human body has so much intricate design uh, with which it is designed that every day they find something new. Every day, as they, as they explore the human body, uh, you know, scientists and doctors are at wonder at, 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 with, with, with the, at the, the complexity of human body. I think, um, so the psalmist is saying, I thank God that I'm wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it, he says. Your workmanship is so marvelous. In fact, as you go on reading a few more verses, this verse, this particular verse that always fascinated me, you know, he says this, you watched me while I'm being formed in my mother's womb. Think about this. Let me just remind that statement and, and listen to that one more time. You, you watched me while I'm being formed in my mother's womb. I always picture this, right? This God who created heavens and the earth uh, sitting there right in front of my mother's womb with his, with his you know, hands on his chin, uh, sorry, his chin on his hands and watching me while I'm being formed in my mother's womb. Nobody, even my mother didn't say that. It's, it's actually... You watched me with love. I think that's the expression he says. You watched me with love while I'm being formed in the mother's womb. Look at this. This is the God of all creation sitting in front of your mother's womb and watching you being formed with love. He must really love us, yeah? He must be thinking that we are really valuable. So it doesn't matter who thinks what about you. It doesn't matter who believes in you or not. I want you to know that God values you. Values you enough that he gives a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for our life. That's number one. Number two. That God designed us to fulfill that purpose. The purpose with which he created us. He designed us in a unique way. God designed you to fulfill his purpose in a unique way. So not only he, he gave me a purpose, but he, 
in order for me to fulfill that purpose, he designed my entire life. He designed who I am in the way that I need to be. Look at that. Let's go back to the same verse. For we are God's handiwork. God's handiwork. The New Living Translation translates that words like this. For we are God's masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece. That's interesting. That we are his workmanship. The Greek word translated, you know, the, the, from which we translate it into English, is actually a word called poema. That's where we get the word called poem. Poema. In Greek, poema simply means a work of art. It could be a statue, it could be a, a song, it could be a piece of architecture, it could, be a, it could be a poem, it could even be a painting. It conveys the idea that something is artfully crafted. Poema refers to God's work in the creation and specifically God's work in you. It describes, Paul is trying to describe to every single Christian, to all of you and me, that, uh, that hey, listen, you are living work of art, God's work. It's, uh, it's interesting that the word he used was masterpiece, you know. If you go to a painting exhibition, and you have this various works of arts around you, you... Uh, you, ultimately, you're going to fix it. You get to you go, you're going to get fixated to one particular painting, which you are going to call a masterpiece. Not everything else, except for that one, right? A masterpiece. It's interesting that God, the Bible describes that each one of us are a masterpiece. Not one of us, not some of us, but each one of us. Is a masterpiece in the hand of God. Work of art. Craftsmanship. You know that the expression itself says this, that God is going to put all his passion, all his intention, all his desire to make you uniquely who you are right now. Fascinating, huh? We tend to compare ourselves with other pieces and think we are not good. But Bible says, no, 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 no. You are a separate, unique masterpiece. John Piper, um, talking about this poema, um, says this, all creation is God's work of art. In um, using this word, poema, God's handiwork. And um, Paul is trying to teach us something interesting. He's trying to tell us this. If God is specifically involved with his hands, you know, you know that in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 where you would see that everything else came by word except for you and me who came by the hands of God. If God involved with his hands, he, that means he has, you, you are a, you are God's hand-on masterpiece, if you are that. If God involved into your life, what is he trying to show through that? Is this, that you are the one who is going to reflect who God is. You may not know this right now, but you are the one who is actually showing to the whole world the kind of God you believe in. You see, each of us reflect God's intention, God's desire for humanity. Each of us reflect God's wisdom at, at work in our, in our lives. Each of us reflect God's power working through our lives. That's what poema means. And man, each of you are totally different and each of you are reflecting something about God. What a privilege it is for us. That God considers us so valuable that he decides that I'm going to sit down with these guys and I'm going to craft them 
into who I want them to become. Like a sculptor, like a potter, like a, like a poet, sitting down and, and crafting us, you know, designing us in a unique way. So we, as I began to think about the design of God in our lives, I realized this, that God takes us through a, through a particular designing process. I want to call it design process. With three different dimensions. That all of us go through that particular designing process in our lives. The first one is what I want to call a natural dimension. It's like, uh, it's, it's what with which you were born. When God brought you into this world, your background, your cultural background, your family background, and the, uh, and, uh, and the way you grew up in the family, the, the talents with which you were born, the skill set with which you were born, all this natural, uh, uh, what I want to call a natural dimension. All of us, um, are born with that. Then there is a second dimension, the design process. You're, you're, you're brought into this world with one particular design, and then you, be, you are begin, be, being enhanced through a different dimension, what I want to call an experience dimension. It's like embroidery. <coughs> Excuse me. You have um, a piece of cloth, You know, a natural piece of cloth. And then you, do, you begin to do embroidery over it because you're trying to enhance the beauty of that particular cloth. Right? The piece of garment. I think that's what God is trying to do uh, while he's taking us through an experience dimension. The experiences that you face every single day, your daily experiences, the relationships that you build up, the pain and the suffering that you go through. Well, Christians always talk about pain and suffering. Let's talk about good things. Uh, but the, the successes that you face, the promotions that you get, the, you know, the, the ranks that you get in your education, all these experiences, good and bad, even ugly ones, all these experiences, life experiences that you go through, God uses all of them. God uses all the relationships, good, bad, ugly, all relationships that you encounter every single day, that you develop, the friendships that you develop, God uses all of them to begin to enhance you into a particular shape. A design is, is, being, is being formed through your daily experiences. Paul puts that beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, verses 3, 3 and 4. All praise to God, he says, the Father of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father, the source of all comfort. He comforts in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When we are troubled, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given to us. So if God allowed you to go through a painful experiences, sometimes he allows you to go through those painful experiences uh, because he can show his comfort to you. He can give his care to you. When you receive his care and his comfort, you would be in a position at some point where you can then reflect the same care, same comfort that you receive from God to somebody else who's going through the same pain. Hi. Same difficulty. So all life experience that you go through, God uses it to design you to become a blessing to somebody else. That's why Paul um, writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, talking about how uh, we should be transformed in our mind, right? That verse in message version the way he, he, you know, it is, it is, it is um, translated in message version. Uh, he uses this, uh, you know, the, the translator uses this, translates Greek into our English, colloquial English, by like saying this: "Take your everyday life seriously. 
take your everyday life seriously. I you know you think about the, the, the meaning behind that verse. He's actually saying this. The writer is reminding us, hey, you may think your life is mediocre. You may think your job is mediocre. You may think getting up in the morning and think, another day, man. You may think like that. Another day at the desk. Another day in the classroom. You may think like that, but I want you to know this. That every single day, every single task that you, uh, that you do in a, in, a, in a day, every single person that you meet in a day, everything, take, seriously, take them seriously, because God is going to use all of those daily life experiences to shape you. We never take that seriously, right? Our life. He's actually doing something in, inside you. Uh, as you go through your life, every day's life, shaping you. That's what I want to call an experience dimension where you are being enhanced every single day. Then there is a third dimension of design and of this design process. I want to call it the equipping dimension. Equipping dimension. So once he, he, you know, he brought you into this world with certain things, then he begins to enhance your life in uh, your design through your experiences. Then, when you personally accept Jesus Christ as your savior, not when you are born into a Christian home, but when you actually have a born again experience. So this is applied, this particular dimension is applied, design process is applied to those who are new in Christ. That's why Paul is saying this, um, 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 for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. Created in Christ. You know why he used that? Because the word created is two dimensional. One, physical, which is we are, you know, we are created. But there is a second one. We are recreated in Christ. Because of our sin, we lost our connection with God, our image with, you know, uh, we have lost our image, image of God has gone, image of Adam has come in. Uh, uh, when we allow Jesus into our life, when we ask for forgiveness for our sins and accept Jesus as our personal savior, we are being restored into the image of God. Now that image, when you are being adapted into God's family, that means when you become a Christian, not a Christian namesake Christian, but a Christian who follows Christ, there is a third dimension of designing in you that God, through his spirit, puts gifts inside you. We call them spiritual gifts. Bible calls them spiritual, not me. Bible calls them spiritual gifts. But these are unique abilities. Only God can give. These abilities are brought into our lives by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, this is what I'm trying to say. If you have Christ in you, you are one step ahead of everybody else in the world. Did you know that? Because everybody in the world is born with the natural dimension and they're going through the experiential dimension, but they don't have the equipping dimension. Only you and me who know Christ as their personal savior. We have that. Peter calls it in 1 Peter chapter 1, sorry, chapter 4, verses 10. This is what Peter says. God has given each of you, each of you, not everybody in the world, you, those who know Christ, each of you, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So you, you may not know this, but all of you, if you have Jesus in your life, a gift only you possess, nobody else else. A gift so uniquely given to you because of your unique design with which you are born into this world and for the unique purpose with which you, for, for which you are born into this world. A gift that could be used in order to fulfill that purpose in your life. Romans chapter 12 verses 6. Paul reflects the same thought like Peter and he says this, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. So in other words, Paul is trying to say this, that each of you have a different gift. Don't look at somebody else's gift and think that's a big gift and you have a small gift. 
He's actually saying each gift is unique. You may think um, it's not a, you know, for some of us, we think standing up here and preaching is, is a big gift. No, it's not. I want you to know it's the most difficult job in this world. Not preaching, preparing. So don't, don't, you don't want my job, by the way. You really don't want my job. So don't compare your gifts with somebody else. Your gift is uniquely given to you um, because of your design, because of your experiences in life. So we, um, I told you, you got a specific purpose. In order for you to uh, fulfill that purpose in your life, God designed you in a unique way. Number three, the third statement that I want you to um, know um, that can explain the concept of design is this, that unless you discover the purpose of God, that purpose of God for your life, your life is incomplete and unsatisfied. Unless you discover the purpose of God for your life, you will always be incomplete, always be unsatisfied. Irrespective of how successful you are in your job, irrespective of how much money you made in your life, irrespective of how high you go, you are there, at some point you're going to sit there and feel very void in your heart unless you know the purpose of your life. That's why St. Augustine, after his um, dramatic uh, transformation from being a debaucherous, immoral, adulterer life to a person who loves God, and that's why he's become a saint, um, that, uh, you know, he, he says this, that we are all, every human being, all of us are created with a God-sized vacuum in our heart. That we have that. Unless God fills that, you'll never feel Satisfied, you never feel complete. So unless you know the purpose of your life, you'll always be incomplete and unsatisfied. You're making money, you're being successful, but you always feel... So Paul is trying to answer that part of our life and he's saying this, for we are... God's handiwork, we talked about it, created in Christ, we talked about it, to do good works. That is the purpose of God for our life. To do good works. The word good works is better explained in the story Jesus told about a guy called Samaritan. No name, he's just called Samaritan. Well, in fact, he's called the good Samaritan. Have you ever thought about why was he called a good Samaritan? The story, this, this particular Samaritan gained an, a, a, an adjective to his name, good, because of what he had done. Right? We know the story, the story of how a Jew was going from one city to another city, was, uh, was caught in between by bandits and was beaten black and blue. That's, that's what you would see in Luke chapter. This story is found in Luke chapter um, 15. Sorry, Luke chapter 10. Was uh, beaten black and blue and was uh, thrown in the middle of the street, in the middle of wilderness um, to die. Nobody wanted to help him because everybody was busy. Everybody had their own work to do, attend to. Uh, nobody wanted to take a risk. In rescuing him, this Samaritan who is on his way uh, he, uh, on a particular business to another city um, sees this Jew uh, in the middle of the road, um, almost uh, taking his last breath, um, you know, becoming semi, -con semi you know, conscious, uh, almost into semi conscious, um, decides that he's going to stop and help him. Now, here is something I want you to know that Samaritan was not. Uh, at that point of time, um, was not free. He had some work. He's going from one city to another city. So that doesn't mean he has time. He doesn't have time. That does mean he has no, he has no time, you know. He's, he's on his journey. He didn't stop to help him, the Jew, because he had time or because he had resources. He didn't have time. He had work, but he still chose to stop and help him. 
still chose to stop and use his resources to a guy who he knows when he wakes up is not going to respect him. I want you know Samaritans were outcast in Indian context. There would be people who are um, not allowed into society. I, I didn't want to use the words. Uh, He knows that if I help this guy, tomorrow when he becomes better, he's not even going to say thank you to me. He may not even respect me for helping him. Why should I stop in the middle of my work, use my money to serve a guy who may be unthankful to me in the future? But he decides to stop anyway. He decides to use his money anyway. He decides to help anyway. And that's why Jesus called it good. That's the point. In the sight of God, that means good is to help somebody else. In the sight of God, good means that I use what I have for the benefit of others. So God created us, equipped us, has given us these gifts that he had given to us so that we can bring good to others. The purpose of God is that we may do good. We may do what is good uh, to others, what is good to the world. Um, that I serve God by serving others. That's one of the reasons why, you know, we ask you to um, to, to do the shoe boxes, you heard the um, announcement, right? The shoe boxes announcement. Every year we take the opportunity during the Christmas time to do something good for the society. It's funny that Christians only feel doing good only in December. That's why we thought we'll make use of that attitude and use shoe boxes. But isn't it true that, uh, that that particular goodness is supposed to be every day's thing, not a Christmas thing? That is what Paul was trying to point out to you and to me. It's not only in the Christmas time that you become more generous, more good. It's every day for which you are prepared. God designed you to be good to others, to do good to others, to um, use your talents, use your giftings, use your properties, use your finances, um, use your positions in your job, you, use your um, skill sets to, uh, you know, for the benefit of others. That does not mean that you don't use it for yourself. It simply means that God wants you to develop a heart that Whatever I have, I want to share it with somebody else too. For the benefit of others. In other words, he's, he's calling you to, to, to use what he had already given to you to help somebody who is unable to help themselves. Why are we doing this good for let me answer that question so that you may understand the good works part. We do this good for others not because we want to feel good. Not because we want to feel fulfilled. But because they may know God. That's the point. You don't do good so that you will feel satisfied. You will feel as if, okay, finally I finished my job as a Christian now. You do good to others. You do things, of, things that will benefit others because they may know, through your actions, they may know God. So if I have to um, explain the purpose of God for your life is this, that I serve God by serving others by using my gifts. Let me, close, let me take, um, take you to the fourth, fourth uh, statement. That explains your design. No, number one, you are designed by God for a very specific purpose. Number two, your, your design process 
is a very unique one. God designed you to fulfill his purpose in a unique way. Number three, um, unless you discover the purpose of your life, you're always going to be incomplete and unsatisfied. Number four, you need to discover your, and develop and demonstrate your spiritual gifts to accomplish his purpose. Unless you discover, develop and demonstrate your spiritual gifts, you can never accomplish his purpose. If you don't know the purpose of God, you are going to feel incomplete. But even if you know the purpose of God, you can never accomplish it without using the spiritual gifts. Does it make sense now? That's why God gave you these gifts very specifically. The spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit for you, specifically those who know Christ and follow Christ, for you so that you can then begin to use those gifts in order to accomplish the purpose of God. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance. These are not some random gifts that God gave you. That God, uh, on the day you accepted Jesus Christ, that God said, okay, let me give a new gift to him. What, should, what gift should I give? No, no, no. He already knew what kind of gift you would need in order to fulfill the purpose that he already brought you into this world. Does it make sense? So that's why I said each gift that you, you and me possess are totally unique. That our life experiences add up um, a glamour to the gift that God is going to give, you know, has given to us in order to make it more beneficial to others. That's why it is necessary for every Christ-believing believer, Christ-following disciple, to discover their gifts. We designed the growth track for that, actually. The second week of growth track, we, we, we help you to go through a, um, a spiritual gift mapping. You know, we call it a questionnaire. We call it a gift mapping. Uh, it's a... It's a, it's a it's a question paper that you will go through in order to discover the kind of gifts that God placed you in, uh, God placed in your life. So that you may begin to then develop them and begin to use them. So I know it's a promo for growth track. Um, that's a good one. God already designed you, wired you, planned your life. Um, in, in, in such a way that how, you know, by giving certain gifts uh, that, that, that as you use them, the best will come out of your life for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. So design, your design reveals your destiny. Um, you know, each of us have different gifts. Like Peter said this, that God has given to each, of, each one of you a gift um, from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another, he says. Paul explains that thought a little more further in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If uh, it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. Uh, if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Each gift is different. Each gift is for a specific purpose and each gift is for others. So you can't you, can't not, you cannot not use the gift God gave you. What good is a tool if you don't use it? If you are somebody who loves God and you are following God, you need to know you already have that gift. You may not know that you have a gift. That's why Paul, in fact, talking about these gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1, he says... My brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant of the gifts that God gave you, he says. 
no christian should be ignorant of this that's why the, we designed the growth track because we know in capstone we don't want anybody to be ignorant of what god gave you already you should know that you should know what god gave you and you begin to use that and that's how you make a difference through your world uh, in your world each of us have a gift you may not know that some of you even though you may not know it may be using it you just didn't know that that is your gift the reason we want you to discover your gift is because so that you can then begin to develop it further focus on that and and, and you know begin to demonstrate it in an effective way through your life so let me um, bring this whole thought into conclusion my purpose if if you didn't listen to anything just listen to this today and take it with you my purpose is to serve god by serving others by using my gifts my spiritual gifts that's the thought that's the lesson that i wanted to leave you with today my purpose is to serve god by serving others by using the spiritual gifts that he gave me when you do that do you know you would accomplish more with your life not only personally but also professionally but also relationally most importantly spiritually that you would achieve more things that you would begin to make more impact through your life i didn't say that jesus said that in john chapter 14 jesus talks to his disciples and this is what he says john chapter 14 verses 12 very truly i say to you whoever believes in me will do the, the works that i have been doing and they will eat, they will do even greater things i mean god must really love us huh? that he decides that you not only get to do the things that jesus had done you would even do better things than jesus so when you uh, begin to use the gifts spiritual gifts that god gave you in, uh, in serving others um then you would do much greater things god didn't give you a prophecy gift so that you can sell your prophecy send me 20 rupees i'll send i'll tell you one promise or buy my oil then i can pray for your healing no that's not why god gave me a healing gift <clears throat> so we we i i challenge you to know this i, I want i want you to go back with that that I, we want you to discover the gifts that god gave you not because we want you to sp- feel superior spiritually but we want you to humble yourself in the sight of god and say thank you for using my life i thought i was useless but thank you for giving me this gift so that i can help somebody else